Hello, everyone. Welcome to Achieving Success with Olivia Akin. I'm your host, Olivia Akin. Each week, we will discuss the roadmap of achieving your personal and professional success. We give you real life stories on growing personally and professionally to achieve your life and career goals with the help of some top notch guests. Today, we are speaking with Jonathan Bartell. Jonathan has been a pharmacy consultant and clinical pharmacist for the past nine years. In addition to working in a hospital as a pharmacist, Jonathan has held every role within pharmacy, which has given him the tools to grow his consulting business to help industry professionals on all aspects from ranging from medication administration, guidance on local and state federal laws, administrative and healthcare management, and more. You can find Jonathan on his LinkedIn by searching Jonathan Bartell, PharmD, or emailing him at jonathan.m.bartell at gmail.com. Hello, Jonathan. It's fantastic having you on the show. Hi, Olivia. Thank you for having me. To start off the show, can you tell me what success means and looks like to Jonathan Bartell? Oh, sure. Um, success is really hard not an easy thing to describe. Um, I mean, cause everybody views it differently, whether it's achieving a certain professional achievement, a financial status, uh, or just a certain level for me, it's kind of a whole bunch of different things. Yes. Professional achievement is definitely my ultimate goal. Um, <clears throat> but also, you know, I want to be fulfilled in my interpersonal life and be a positive role model for my children and making a positive impact in the profession of pharmacy. So, I can't sit here and say that my ultimate goal is to make it to this level or that level. My ultimate goal is to have self-fulfillment at the end of my career, knowing that I, I did. I made an impact in the, in the uh, profession. And I think self-fulfillment is something that is so important because it is a part of what has shaped you and why you do things, but also the legacy you live. Because if you are self-fulfilled, then others will feed off that as well and lead by example, to that. And Jonathan, no matter our ages, we've all dealt with medications and pharmacists, some easier than others, right? We've all had that (laughs) late night cold or that last minute prescription needed to be filled. And it just isn't happening the way we want it. There's either stress on the pharmacist's end because not everything is the pharmacist's fault, guys. I know sometimes they're on the front line. It's real easy to blame them. Um, But there are other things at play sometimes. Um, But for you, what made you decide to become a pharmacist? And what was that journey like? Well, it was not an easy journey to begin with. But uh, I grew up, um, my my parents were divorced and my stepfather was a pharmacist. And he was a co-owner with two other owners. Um, It was a small independent chain in the uh, scranton Wilkesbury area in Pennsylvania. And growing up, um, just being around it and seeing the positive impact he had on on everybody he he treated, like his own family members, constantly calling him over the physician. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. And then I got to grow up around the business and see how it worked, you know, the retail aspect. And like Olivia said, yes, it's not always our fault. There's so many factors in the retail setting that goes on that's way beyond our control. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I grew up and I was like, I really think this is an intriguing profession. Science to me was always my my definite strong point. Um, my level of interest was always sky high with science, chemistry, biology. So that was the main driving point that you know made me go into there. And the journey was not easy. Uh, I me- I remember going in high school to my uh, my counselor and I'm saying, "Hey, can I get a le- letter of recommendation?" And this guy was such a like a well renowned. Uh, teacher in the school district. And he's like, you know, what's the school? And I said, Wilkes University. And he said, oh, what are you looking at? I said, I want to be a pharmacist. He's like, John, 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 that's not for you. That's for the other kids that were in National Honor Society. He's like, you're a good athlete. He's like, why don't you become a gym teacher? And I said, well, there's nothing wrong with becoming a gym teacher. I said, but that's not what I want to do. So after going back and forth, he finally wrote the letter of recommendation. I got accepted to university of our Wilkes University. I chose that over, you know, uh, University of Miami, um, Temple University. I had a couple offers to play football. I turned them all down to go to Wilkes for pharmacy. Um, I was playing. I played two years of baseball there, and 
my grades going in, I was never a good studier. I never really knew how to hit the books, how to really get it so that I learned what I was really studying. And it took me a year. And that first year was God awful and had no reflection on my intelligence or my capabilities. Um, and I remember at the end of the, uh, the, the year, my advisor called me in. He said, Hey, John, he's like, listen, this is not for you. He's like, I'm just telling you, it's not for you. And I said, listen, I know my grades were terrible. I'm going to retake those classes. We're going to get it back on track. I said, I promise. He's like, okay, okay. Kind of shrugged me off. So we took the classes and I never looked back. I started going through all the classes, came time to you know apply for pharmacy school. And I took the uh, PCATs, the entrance exam, I did well. And I get a rejection letter saying, yep, yeah, sorry, we can't let you in, even though my grades were good. So then I uh, had to go meet with him again. I said, I don't understand. Why can't I get in? He's like, listen, we don't think you can handle pharmacy load. So what we're going to do is we're going to let you take medical microbiology and um, a full year of biochemistry. Pharmacy students only had to take a semester. He's like, if you pass those classes, then we're going to, we'll let you in. I said, okay. Took those classes, passed them. I get a rejection letter the next summer. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And they said, yeah, we still don't think you can handle the coursework. I said, what else do I have to do? So at this point I'm thinking, well, it's, it's over. Uh, I'm going to have to think of another avenue. I'm already two years behind where I should be. And wouldn't you know, two weeks before class, I get an acceptance letter. And I went through, I graduated with a 3.4 in pharmacy school. Um, and the coolest moment was when I went to uh, graduation, walk on stage, there's the dean, there's my advisor. They both shook my hand and just smiled at me. And they said, you, you proved us wrong. You did it. And that was a really cool and fulfilling moment in my life just to sit there and be like, yeah, I did. You know, I, I think nowadays too many people, they face adversity. They just throw in the towel and they just walk away because they're, they're afraid to really dig in and really dive deep. And it was a gut check for me. I mean, it really was, I could have done the same thing. I could have just walked away and just said, eh, forget it. But, um, I mean, I put in the countless hours of studying and, you know, doing everything I can to well, prove them wrong. And that was, that was a really cool moment in life. And I think it just shows, and you had mentioned this in telling that story of when you're hit with the nose, with the rejection, with others thinking that you're just not going to be able to achieve that goal. It's about digging in and going, okay, what else do I need to be doing? How do I need to challenge myself? But also, what do I need to give up short term to hit my long term goal? When you were going through that, and even today, when you're going through those struggles, what are things that you do that really make sure you're striving to hit those goals that you're digging in and that you're pushing yourself as much as you can to achieve those goals? Well, I look at it this way. Um, you know, success is also achieved when putting in the work when people aren't around. Um, you know, it's not always what you do in front of people that is the driving force. It's what you do behind the scenes that means more. So for me, when I face tough situations where, again, it's that, do I just say, forget it and walk away? Or do I, you know, try harder? I remember all the hard times and the things that I've done. Um, and I know that when I persevered, I know what the outcome was going to be. I was an athlete my whole life. I played baseball. I played football. I was very active in powerlifting. Um, and so I know what it's like to put in the work and I know what it's like to also be successful in those areas. Uh, you know, I played baseball. I, I was invited to major league, uh, camps, um, football. I had a couple of offers to play in college powerlifting. I set three state records. Like, I know what it's like to have your back up against the wall and say like, okay, it's time you got to do this. Uh, and I feel, I really feel that athletics is a very strong driving point for me. It had a very major uh, positive influence on my life and the way I view life and the way I view putting in hard work. Um, and this is something that I totally drive home with my kids because both my kids play, play sports now. And, you know, it's hot. It's in the summer. And dad, I don't, I'm like, listen, I'm like, let's talk. <laughs> and I give them my little spiel. And I, I, I kind of feel like that dad, but at the same time, I mean, it works. You know, you have to, you have to have that mindset that no matter what you have a goal 
you go for that goal and you're going to get there no matter what gets in your way. For you as well, you know, being the athlete and being in different sports that you'd mentioned, football, baseball, um, weightlifting, all these different levels or different sports at high competitive, high pressure moments, right? You're not, you know, nothing wrong with this. You're not that six-year-old kids that playing on the peewee team at that point. You were look, being looked at to play at a very high level. You're performing at a very high level. When it gets to that level, what are some of the skill sets and mentality that you took from playing those different sports at the level and go into your job and what you do today and how you look at it? Well, I mean, it really, again, it, it's all the, the time that I put in, you know, let's just say baseball, for example. It's not about just going to the game and taking a couple swings and hitting the ball. Like there's countless hours that, you know, God bless my dad. God bless him. He passed away um, when I was 19. But he was like a major positive influence on me. Um, every day I would call him up, like he'd be out of work at four. I'd be like, hey, come pick me up. Let's go to the baseball field. And we would go to, we would drive around the city for hours looking for an open field. And we finally get one. And he would throw 300 balls to me. I'd just keep swinging and swinging. And my dad used to always like have this thing. He used to like chirp in my ear. Like if I was having a slump or I was down, he'd be like, yeah, you know, this player looked pretty good tonight. And he would just get underneath my skin just enough that it would push me that even though like I was mad, I was just disgruntled that little voice of reason, which was really busting me, um, really propelled me to work harder and strive harder. Um, and, and today, I mean, when I look at it, I mean, ph uh, pharmacy is not an easy profession to work in. Um, again, you have, well, there's different levels. I mean, you have your retail, which to me, I worked in retail. It's a very hard profession. God bless those pharmacists because they deal with a lot. You're getting yelled at, you know, people are sick. They don't feel good. They don't want to be in the pharmacy. And like, you know, you have phones ringing, drive throughs You got doctors calling, yelling at you. The nurses are yelling at you. Why isn't this filled? Why isn't that filled? The insurance is rejection. You have to call the insurance. Three people want a flu shot. And like, I need recommendation for Tylenol. I need a whatever. I mean, it, there's a lot going on there. Um, it's hard to to really manage all that stuff. And when you look at it, you're like, how do I get through this day? Like. <laughs> Like how? And it's again, it, you know, it's a it's a step by step process, just like with everything in life. You start at the bottom, you work your way up. So each day you have your baseline, and what you do is you take things as they come, and you just take it step by step. Um, I work in a hospital now. Same thing. It's you know, nurses calling me. Where's this? Where's that? I have a, a sick kid in the emergency room. I need antibiotics. Uh, what's the dose of this? What's the dose of that? Can you can you just do it for me? Like, it's a lot of pressure. Um, but again, it's knowing that I put in countless hours of studying, I have to do so many countless hours of continuing education that I don't just take for granted. I really sit down. I really make sure I know what I'm doing. I, I learn new things. Keeping up with today's medicine is a chore in its own and remembering the other stuff that you've had forever. So it's, it, it is a challenge, but at the end of the day, you know, I used to, uh, I would sit down with patients, go up to the room, sit down, discuss, their uh, discharge instructions, discharge prescriptions. And at the end of the day, when like you sit down and you discuss, discuss it with them and they actually look at you and they're like, Oh my God, you know, thank you. I, cause if I, I know if I went to the retail pharmacy, he would not have the time to sit down with me and do this. And to me, at the end of the day, that's really a main reason why I like what I do. You just touched upon this and you also touched upon it earlier. And I wanted to ask you, you know, working, in healthcare, there's a lot of different aspects to it, a lot of knowledge that you have to absorb. And like you had just mentioned, keep up to date with. And there's a lot of education that goes into that. There's no checking a box and then you never have to revisit it. Because if you check that box and then never revisit it, there can be some major effects that start to happen. Pharmacy also takes a lot of understanding, not just about medication, not just about people and dealing with people, but how that medication interacts with different 
within your body in different situations and how the medication can really act and when's the right time to fill it, things like that. For you, how do you keep up to date? And you kind of just brought this up and touched upon it a little bit. But how do you stay up to date with all those new medications coming out, the regulations and more within pharmacy? And then how do you try to, when you're consulting in the pharmacy world, make sure that you're in laying that same procedure and that same thought to other pharmacists? Well, I mean, my role in a hospital and consulting, they're, I mean, fairly different. Um, the the way that I stay up to date on everything, it varies um, not by job, but by opportunity. So sometimes I'll have an opportunity to go do a live CE, which is, to me, I love the live CEs because I found out that you learn so much more by being there than sitting down and reading an article or a journal article. Um, but I mean, for me, I don't, I don't really get those too much. I mean, I have two kids very active in sports. I'm going five, six, seven days a week sometimes, and I don't have time to make those meetings. So then it really does fall back on me to sit down and, you know, read these articles, take the, we have to do, um, an assessment at the end, pass the assessment, and then you get your, uh, continuing edu- education credits. So I do that. Um, we have to have 30 every two years. But to be honest with you, I mean, maybe I'm a slight overachiever and I usually end up somewhere in the 50s to 60s just because I'll find another article like, oh, this is interesting. I'll read it and take the test just for the heck of it. Um, I do try to stay on top of it. And I do most of it like around this time of year because of the fact that this is like my downtime. Um, Both, like I said, baseball and football. So we'll start up in April and I'll go from April to mid-November. which is obviously my busy time. And I don't really have too much time between that. You know, I work full time at the hospital. I'm uh, doing my, my consulting. Um, I work per diem with, with the dispensary, doing medical reviewing. I got a lot on my plate during that time. So continuing education kind of slides down my list a little bit. But I feel like uh, in the uh, my off season per se, I do keep up with it. And I love how you just said you're off season. And it just shows how much of an athlete you really are. That you look <laughs> at it as the off season. Um, next, you're going to mention training camp. I know at some point you'll probably bring that in. Um, and it's your training camp days, right? But I want to dig in to that aspect of it. Because no matter where you are and how busy you are, you really do have to keep up with things in the medical industry, especially when you're dealing with medications. And like you had said earlier, there's so many different moving pieces, no matter whether you're working in a hospital, you're consulting, you're the pharmacist at CVS. There's always so much going on that what is something that a lot of people, you know, when they're sick, when they're approaching a pharmacist, they're not really thinking about, hey, they're also doing all these other things or, you know, they're not aware that it really being a pharmacist, what it takes or what they're dealing with on a day to day basis for you. What would be the thing that you would like to shed a little light on about what it's like being a pharmacist that people don't typically think about? Well, I mean, and to be honest with you, I mean, I would probably, you know, gear this question more towards the retail sector um, because as inpatient, I mean, it's a, it's a lot different, but the one, the one thing, and I heard it time and time again, someone would come in for something as simple as an inhaler. And, you know, we like, you know, it might be 20, 25 minutes, you know, and whatnot. So like, for someone that, you know, really doesn't understand the process of what's really going on behind that little curtain, that little window, is that you look on the counter and say, well, that's my inhaler. It's right there. Just put a label on it and it's done. But I mean, what most pharmacies now are set up kind of similar, different software. But so the patient brings in a new prescription. Someone has to scan it in. Someone has to verify the new insurance. Then you have to verify all the correct, you know, uh, personal data, where they live, their address, date of birth, any new drug allergies. They have to enter all that in the computer. And then once that gets it gets scanned in, then they have to enter the prescription, everything off of the prescription. So then at that point, it goes over to a pharmacist where they have to verify that all that is correct. 
Now, if you think about it, if there's five people in line, each person has five, two to three prescriptions apiece. You can see how just that short period of time can extremely back up a pharmacist because you have to verify all those pieces. Now it goes back over once that's verified to go back to a technician who's actually going to physically fill the medication. Now, once that's done, it goes back over to the pharmacist again, where they have to physically verify that it's the correct product. And then once again, that's like your last safety check to make sure that everything is indeed correct. Because medication errors, unfortunately, do happen. Um, it's not something that anybody takes lightly. Uh, I know, I mean, we all make mistakes. I've had a couple when I was working retail. And, you know, once it hits you, you're like, oh, my God, how did I miss that? Well, the thing of it is, and the, the driving point that I can make to any person, is be patient. I know you're sick. We know you don't feel good. We know you want to go home. Okay. However, by adding more stress, being being impatient um, is only increasing the stress level on the staff, which increases the risk that there could something be missed. Um, you know, it's always best, you know, if you're dropping off a prescription, drop it off, go, you know, go get gas, come or do something you have to do, and then come back. Because in that chain of command, like I mentioned, what else can happen? Well, then you have, like I said before, two people come in, they need vaccines. So that's more paperwork you have to do. If they're narcotic prescriptions, there's a lot more legalities that go into it. We have to do our inventory check. There's double, triple checks on the accounts. The um, then you have an insurance issue. Let's just say one of the prescriptions that are written. Well, the insurance wants a prior authorization or it's not covered. And you have to call the doctor now. And I have to wait for them to call you back because you know, we need an alternative, um, which one thing I like working in a hospital is we work side by side with the doc. So that's a heck of a lot easier. Nobody even that, that process takes a second and a half. But in the retail setting, if you're calling a physician's office, we all know what their office is like. You know, it's hectic, crazy with people, especially this time of year, everybody's sick. Um, so now we have to wait for them to get back to us, which now you tell the patient, hey, listen, this isn't covered. You're going to have to wait a little bit longer because we have to wait for Dr. So-and-so to call me back. And then that infuriates them even more. And then it just, as you can see, this slowly, you know, can back things up. So it is like the gold standard where everybody's like, oh, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. But in actuality, sometimes we can get it out in two minutes, you know. However, sometimes it could be an hour. Um, but the biggest driving point is be patient, not only just to your pharmacist, but to anybody who works in a retail setting, whether it's the butcher, whether it's the guy at the deli counter, the, the cashier. I mean, everybody has a job to do. And it's just, you know, just be patient. And one thing people don't always realize, and I have learned this over the years, is that not everyone behind the counter at a pharmacy can actually touch the medication. If the pharmacy is a small mom and pop and they are hiring someone just to, you know, to, like have you pay for your medication, they're not an actual pharmacist. They cannot be touching the medication. So sometimes it too is how many people can be touching the medication versus how many staffers you actually have in that environment. What is everyone's capability? And sometimes when you see a lot of people available, no matter the setting, you can forget that not everyone has the education, the backing to be touching certain pieces of that line and that machine and that area that you were just speaking about. Jonathan, something that I mentioned in the beginning that I also think is important to really get a idea of this is that you made it a point not to just understand within all the environments of the hospital what it takes to be a good pharmacist and put in the hours and put into the work but also pain centers, nursing home, the list goes on and on. For you, why was it important to be a part of those different environments within the pharmacy field and instead of entering one and staying in one? And how do you think that has helped you grow as an individual as well as a pharmacist? Well, that's a great question because a lot of people, a lot of pharmacists, they go into school, graduate, they go to one job. They work their careers over and 30 years. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I mean, I, 
I know a lot of people who just, that was their mindset. That's what they want. This is what they want to do. And that's fantastic. That is, you know, good for them. That's great. As I mentioned earlier, my stepfather owned pharmacies and my goal was to purchase them. Well, after uh, I was, I got engaged, my ex-wife or my wife, wife to be at the time, we moved to Philadelphia because she was studying um, radiology. And so we were down there and I was working for Walgreens and then I was coming back up here and we were already having discussions about purchasing the business and everything like that. And he said, that's yes. Let's like start working on that. He's like, but right now I don't have any stat, like any room to actually have you come in yet. So I was like, okay, that's fine. So I, when I moved back home, I went and I worked for Walmart for four years and then, it, you know, it was challenging in its own, but um, then he, I got the call and said, okay, listen, I'm ready. Let's do this. Uh, so I said, okay. So I made the jump, started working there, trying to learn the ins and outs because I would only pick up a shift here and there. And so I really didn't know everything, but so I started working there and then I find out, I know it's bad to say this, but I turn on the news and I see, oh, local pharmacy was sold to Rite Aid. It's like, oh, oh, okay. Well, that kind of derails my plans a little bit. Um, because it was a two third ownership. Well, two of the owners said, yes, let's sell the Rite Aid. He said, let's sell the Jonathan. Well, he was overruled. They sold to Rite Aid. So I ended up working for Rite Aid for two and a half years. I was a pharmacy manager there. And I just remember one day I was just like, I, in my life, I've never been that type of person to just be like to accept com complacency. Um, I'm always thinking ahead. I'm always thinking about my next move, always thinking about how I can better myself. And I just remember one day I had a break and I just sat down like in the corner in the pharmacy. I just looked and there was this mat that stood in front of this terminal and it was old. You could tell it's probably been there like 20 years and there was two feet mark, like foot marks in there. And they were embedded in this memory foam. Like that's how like long. So I'm like, you know, someone's going to stand in the same spot in the same space doing the same job for the rest of their life. And again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but for me, that's not who I am. Um, I always had a vision that I want to keep going. Like, you know, there's no, <clears throat> you know, success doesn't just happen by standing still. So for me, I was like, let's, let's, let's try something here. So an opening came up with the Veterans Affairs Hospital and I had no zero inpatient experience. And the drugs that are used in the hospital are far different than the ones you see in the outpatient setting. A lot of IV mixtures, antibiotics that you never see in retail. It's like stuff that you learned in school. You're like, eh, I'll never hear that again. And oh, you do. So I just remember like I started working at the VA and it was supposed to be a clinical role. And it was, it was semi-clinical. I would go up and do uh, morning rounds with physicians and I'd work a little bit in the ICU, but I did a lot more outpatient stuff. And to me, I was like, oh God, it's like, I'm still in retail. And then I finally got an opening with where I'm at now, the hospital, and I got in. And now this one I thought was fantastic because not only am I going to have clinical experience because this was a direct clinical role, but now I'm getting exposure to pediatrics, the NICU, um, our ER, our ICU, which was far different than the ICU at the VA. And then on top of that, I also was able to start working with our infusion center. And I learned about chemotherapy and how to do chemo and uh, doing approvals, cost-saving effective measures for the hospital. Um, I got to do so much and learn so much. And unfortunately at the time I was going through a divorce and I was just looking for something so small on the side. And this one pharmacist said, listen, have you ever thought about consulting? I'm like, what's consulting? I'm pharmacy, what is consulting? And so she, you know, described it to me and working in a nursing home, being the, the sole go-to guy, like you're the one who reviews all the charts. You're the one who makes the, all the recommendations to the physician. And I said, yeah, it sounds really interesting. So I got fortunate enough, which believe me, these jobs are so hard to find and get into. It just so happened it fell on my lap. So I took it and I've been doing that for the last five years. And it's really cool because now I am the lead antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist point of contact. Uh, it's only me. I'm the only one that can review the charts. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then it just so happens again, like, you know, I'm still thinking about what's next. What can I do next? And it just popped up. A friend of mine was working at a medical marijuana dispensary. And I don't know anything about marijuana. I didn't know a thing. 
And I was like, you know what? Why not? So I had an opportunity. I took a, uh, a 12 hour CE course online, learned quite a bit, and then started working in a dispensary. And now, not just seeing marijuana like for recreation, so I'm talking about medicinal. And I mean, the people that I've spoken with who have raved about it, they said, hey, I was on opioid, opioid medications for so many years and I wanted to get off them. And I finally tried this and I'm now I'm off these medications. And it, it was incredible. Um, so it was another journey for me. And then medical reviewing, um, that just kind of popped and fell in my lap again. Uh, I got fortunate enough that someone reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, Hey, what do you think about, you know, doing medical, re medical reviewing for us? And I said, wow, that would be a great idea. I'd love it. So it's, again, I'm always looking for that next step to broaden my edu broaden my experience and really, you know, become a well-rounded pharmacist, not just one lane road. This is my path. That's it. Like I have branched out so much. And if you were to say to me 10 years ago that I would have gained all this experience or a little bit more than 10 years ago, I would have been like, you're nuts. Cause I was trying to just get into a hospital and nobody would hire me because I, they said, well, you don't have hospital experience. I'm like, well, how do you get experience if no one hires you? <laughs> it's, so it's been a great journey. Um, and honestly, I'm still, I'm still looking for my next step. Um, you know, that's self-fulfillment part. You know, I feel like I still have a lot more to learn and give. And I think you brought up so many important points in that. The point of leaning into opportunities, growing, always looking for that next role and preparing yourself. But also the idea that if someone's looking for you and you just mentioned this at the end, hospital experience, they're like, Okay, well, if we're going to hire you as a hospital pharmacist, you have to have the hospital experience. And if you don't have that, you're like, how do I get it? Right. For you, for someone who's looking to go into pharmacy and make that their career, what is some advice you would give to them about how to do that benefits of going into pharmacy, you know, in fulfillment and in role? but then also how they can grow once they're in there as well. So the one thing I made the mistake of doing was when I was like, when I went to school, it was a little bit different with the prerequisites for licensure. So when I was going to school, we had to have, uh, I think it was 1500 hours in three years. Um, you had to have 750 done on your own. And then your last year of school, is 750 that you learned through great, like, your rotations, they call them. So you had to do ambulatory care, internal medicine. Um, like there was a bunch of them that were given, then you could pick your electives. Well, what I should have done thinking back is instead of me just working, I knew I was going into retail at that point, but instead of me just working in a retail, I should have tried to get a job as a technician in a hospital. So therefore I could have had some experience. Now, nowadays, most students, um, when they go to pharmacy school, they graduate and they do a post uh, graduate year residency. When I went to, when I was graduating, they weren't really a big thing. Like, honestly, I think two people, maybe three in my class did one out of 60. We had, they capped us at 60, which was nice. We had small classes. And also I was, you know, I told my wife to be that I said, Hey, you know, I'll move to Philadelphia and take care of the bills. So for me, a residency was not on the cards. So a lot of pharmacists, even if they are just say retail based, right, they can do a residency and now they have a post year graduate residency in a hospital with their clinical work and there's your in. Um, like I said, for me, I had neither one. And I, it's funny because my boss who hired me at where I'm at Moses Taylor, she literally said to me at one point, she's like, you know, I know you, uh, you applied, you know, X amount of years ago for another position. She's like, I, I just kind of like tossed your, uh, information to the side because you had no experience. She's like, then you got that one year at the VA and I was like, Oh look, he has hospital experience. Okay. I'll bring him in now. I was like, well, thanks. <laughs> I said, you know, like, come on. I was like, you know, I did a great job. I thrived. Like once I got there again, you know, put in a position of uncertainty and not being as comfortable as I was in knowing what I've known. Um, you know, I really took on the challenge and I've been doing extremely well. Like I said, I've 
I'm now it's just me and one other person. We take care of the infusion center at the hospital. We do all the approvals and uh, it's been, it's been a good ride. And I think that's a pure example too. And I laughed when you said like, she only kind of reconsider you once it met the qualification she was looking for in that yep. hospital experience. She wasn't thinking of the skill sets you could be bringing to the table. And so sometimes, like you said, it's thinking outside the box a little bit and saying, how can I get that experience? It's not necessarily having three different pharmacy jobs or three different jobs to get that one experience, but taking opportunities like the residencies, how how can you position yourself that if you change your mind down the road or you want to go into a different aspect of something, you have the skill sets, you have the experience that someone who might not be as open to taking someone who hasn't had that can feel comfortable doing it. I want to lean into a little bit about how you built up your pharmacy consulting business. You mentioned this earlier and how you're consulting and the benefits of that and what you get to do. But what was the purpose and passion for you to really go out and decide, I'm also going to do pharmacy consulting. I'm also going to do consulting in this environment. And what do you hope to bring to the table due to consulting that might be a gap in the industry or that you might other pharmacists might not be thinking of that you will bring to the table. Well, the cool thing about it, and the reason I, I took it was an, a, a unique opportunity. Um, again, if you go on to Indeed, go on to LinkedIn, go on to Glassdoor or whatever, and you try and search pharmac- consultant pharmacist jobs, they're hard to come by. Um, a lot of them, you know, you might not really find them in the area because a lot of them are just like, uh, centrally located in one place. And there's just this one company that's doing it. For me, it was an opportunity to go to a family run nursing home, like the place where I go, they're great people. It's the mom and uh, her daughters. They're all the nurses like, and it's such like a nice family warm environment. And they do such a great job with the, uh, the residents there. And for me, when I walked in there the first time, they're old school. There's no computers. It's all paper charts, handwritten notes. It's, you know, it's definitely old school, but it's, that's what I think brings that family vibe to it. So when I walked in, I said, geez, like the pharmacist who was doing it before me really didn't have a lot of clinical experience. And I thought to myself, well, geez, like how can I take this to the next step? And I was able to take all my clinical knowledge that I gained working in an inpatient pharmacy, as well as the experiences I've had with dealing with outpatient meds. By com- by combining those together, I was able to take just a simple review where you just walk in and, uh, yeah, the doses are right and that's fine. I don't really have recommendations. But now I dive deeper and it's not just about, well, this dose or that dose. Well, it's actually, I evaluate every single aspect of that chart. Uh, If there's an antibiotic written, let's just say they're on a medication, you know, for a common skin and soft tissue infection. And the doctor writes it for 14 days or 10 days. Well, my, I question that and I'll write a note to him saying, Hey doc, you know, typically the uh, uncomplicated uh, SSTI is only five really warrants maybe five days of therapy right now. You know, we are giving this patient more medication, which can actually, you know, increase resistance rates down the road. So, I mean, by me putting that little spin on it and I do a whole separate antimicrobial uh, worksheet on top of the reports that I do, um, I dive in with opioid management now. So I brought those two to the nursing home that's now we're looking at it and it's like, well, geez, you know, what's this stuff that we really should have been looking at a long time ago. And it's really been taking off. Uh, especially the antimicrobial stewardship. Um, now I told them, I said, if you have any questions, you know, don't take a guess, just give me a call. Like I'll have the doctor call me if he's unsure or thinking about, well, should I do this or should I do that? Give me a call. You know, I'm, I said, I'm always on call for you guys. And we've developed such a great working relationship, not only with just the director of nursing, who is, like I said, one of the daughters 
the owners, um, but even all the other nurses, um, I go with them once a year. We, cause the state comes in and they want to see how are you doing your med pass? So I'll give them pointers. I'm like, okay, let me watch you give it insulin. Let me watch you give oral meds or cr- some, some patients can't really swallow. So you have to make a little slurry. So you take the meds, you crush them, put them in applesauce, and then you give them to them that way. Um, and I make sure that they're doing it the right way. So when the state comes in, they're not going to get in trouble saying, well, you know, you forgot this or you forgot that. So that's another part of my job. I also do annual in-services for the nursing home. So I'll, I'll find a unique topic of interest um, or something that was big. Obviously, you know, we had the COVID years. Um, <clears throat> so like we did something with that. And then I did other things with med administration, um, duration of therapy, uh, was it influenza, pneumococcal vaccines. Like I've done a lot of those things to kind of branch off and give the nursing more education as well. Because they're there's they're mostly LPNs, not RNs, so they don't really have as much education as the RNs do. So it's nice to actually give them. So they may be thinking when they're given a medication, well, why do I have to do this? Oh, well, that's why. Okay, now I get it. So it's 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 pretty cool. We have a great relationship, uh, and even with the finances and even like the cooks. I mean, like I talk to everybody there. That's just me. I'm an outgoing person. <laughs> I can't just sit in a room in an office and just do my work. I have to get out and blab a little bit. So. <laughs> But yeah, that's, I mean, it's been a great, it's been a great ride and something I would, you know, pass on to, you know, students and if they get an opportunity to even, you know, shadow a pharmacist to do um, a consulting position, like definitely try it. It is such a a self-fulfilling position to have. And again, it's like, you look at it, you're like, well, this is mine. Like, you know, what I put, I'm putting into this is really going to make a difference. You know, um, every recommendation, every letter I write and Mm -hmm. it's just, it's great. So yeah, if they get an opportunity, please, even myself, I mean, if there's students in the area that, you know, they can always reach out to me and if I can make it work, you know, I can bring someone with me. They can see exactly what I do on a day-to-day basis. And one thing you mentioned in pharmacy consulting, but really when you think about it has been the theme of our whole conversation today is collaboration. And it really is collaborating, working together, expanding not just your knowledge, but other people's knowledge and how you can feed off each other's strengths. So I think that's really important to also think about whether you are in pharmacy and you're writing those scripts or you're putting together education pieces or, you know, the legal side of it or healthcare management, it all can fall in, especially depending on how big or small your team is. And that pharmacy department is, whether it's in a hospital um, or nursing home, wherever it might be, it's all about collaborating and working together and making sure that you're also showing up in the way that needs to be done to get the job done um, as well. A hundred percent. And I mean, I cannot stress enough the importance of pharmacy technicians. Um, You know, they are like the unsung heroes and that whole thing. I feel like if you don't, if you don't have strong technicians, I mean, your day is going to be miserable and no matter what area you're working in. Um, I've been fortunate enough that I've, I've had very good technicians um, that they do it all. I mean, my God, like the, in the retail setting, you see them, they're the ones that are running around counting and running from the counting tray over to the register, to the drive-through and getting paperwork and going like, they're doing all that running work while you're doing your job. And then in the hospital, like our technicians are running, they're making IVs, they're uh, running medications that are urgent up to the emergency room, up to the ICU. And they're, they're all over the place. So, I mean, also, and if pharmacists are listening to this, please treat your techs good. I mean, honestly, because without them, our job is very, very difficult. Jonathan, how could people get in touch with you if they want to connect with you? Oh, they could definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn or my email. I know that you uh, you mentioned it earlier, uh, but my LinkedIn is Jonathan Bartell Farm D, or you know, on my Gmail account, Jonathan.m.bartell at gmail.com. Um, Love to hear, you know, any questions or feedback or anything like this. This is my first podcast, so I'm hoping I'm doing okay. <laughs> you did amazing. And I think anyone listening would 
say you added lots of flavor and different insight, whether it was from the sports aspect or to the knowledge and wisdom you're sharing in the pharmacy realm. And so I personally think you did a great job and I interview lots of people. So if I'm saying that, you know, you did. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, well, thank you, Jonathan, for all of your insight today. And thank you for having me. This was a, this was a great experience. Well, a few of our key takeaways from today's conversation are when you're hit with no or others are doubting you and telling you you cannot do it, just keep digging in, keep pushing through, keep setting yourself with those goals and what is your angle, but what are those things you can be doing along the way as well that can really be helping you meet that angle, as well as it is also about putting in the work when no one is watching, whether it's pharmacy or learning a new task or learning a new hobby. It is about putting in the work when no one's watching so that you can excel and so that you can grow over time. But it's also about when that work is getting daunting, taking a step back and saying, why am I doing this? What? is that goal that I have in mind? Where would I want to take this? And understanding that there are points down the road that this situation can be setting you up for that you just don't know yet. As well as always think about the next move. I love how Jonathan said that because it is so true. It's about the pivot. It's about taking those skill sets again and seeing how they can fit into the next thing you might want to be doing. Because we are all human. We are always changing. Change is the only certain thing that we will go through in life as well as, and probably my favorite of Jonathan's tidbits from today's conversation is success doesn't just happen standing still. He painted the pictures of those shoes ingrained in that mesh. And it really is true. Change, success doesn't happen by standing still. Change can happen by standing still. But do you want to be successful in that change? This was a great episode with our top-notch guest, Jonathan Bartel. Thank you for listening and have a successful day.